Today on the show, we answer a question from the audience. We talk about Sophie Skoll and the Order of the White Rose. We talk about how normal people like you and I can respond in the face of insults and criticism. Hey, it's Lucas Scrobot, and you are listening to The Lucas Scrobot Show, where we uncover purpose, pursue truth, and own the future. Thank you so much for being with me again today, episode 185 of the show, and we have a great show lined up for you, and it starts all with one question. A question from Michael on Instagram, his handles anatomy. And Michael asks this great question. Michael, because you asked a question, you're actually getting some stickers sent your way. So guys and girls, if you ask a question, whether you WhatsApp me at plus one two zero two nine two two zero two two zero or send me a message over on Instagram or any other platform that you follow me, you ask a question, if it's good enough, which most questions are you will get them answered right here on the show. And with it, I will send you some great stickers. So here's a question from Michael. He asks, how can you exercise an ideology? How can you know if something works or not without getting insulted or criticized? Great question, many parts, and we're going to break it down step by step, which actually leads into some of the ideas that we're going to be talking about in the rest of the episode. So how can you exercise an ideology? Well, it it first starts with understanding that we have ideas and we have ideologies, and then the... (laughs) The downfall can be becoming an ideologue. So what's the difference between those three words? So an idea, you have a singular idea, whether that is a uh, a business idea, a business strategy, whether it's an idea of improving your health, maybe it's as simple as drinking more water, um, going to bed at the right time, being more disciplined in your life. Those things are ideas. When we have a set of ideas, that come together and fit together, we really begin to build what's an ideology, a way of viewing the world through a a multiple set of ideas that are covering multiple spheres of society. So it's not just eating better. It's not just living more disciplined, but it's a whole kind of mantra, a way of living an ideology. Now, the danger with ideologies, with worldviews, is that if the ideology owns us rather than us owning the ideology. And when that happens, we become what's called an ideologue. Now, an ideologue is a person who has taken ideas and ideologies and they've kind of encapsulated the full set, but in a way that they are not critically thinking and examining the things that they believe, but the things that they believe own them. So oftentimes you can tell if a person is an ideologue, if you can know one thing that they believe And then from that one belief point, extrapolate all the other ideologies, all the other viewpoints that they most likely have on the world. And when you talk to these people, ideologues, um, when you talk to ideologues, it is as if a talk track is just running through their brain. When you answer or ask a question, they're always going to be answering along the same party lines. And now this can happen for anyone. This can, you know, I'm subject and and pray to becoming an ideologue. That's something that I actively fight against. And the way that I fight against becoming an ideologue is by taking time to understand the ideas that I believe, understand where they come from and understand where they are going. You do not want to become an ideologue where the ideas own you, but we really have to work hard to own the ideas and own the things that we believe. So as we go on from that point, we have to say, to answer the question, how can you exercise an ideology? And with it is, how do you know if something works or not? Well, the the place that I would start when exercising an ideology, exercising a worldview, is to look to history to look throughout history and whether it's an an idea and an individual and it could be going to your friend, it could be going to a family member who has 
a set of ideas or an idea, whether it's about disciplining your sleep schedule, your eating habits, or growing your business or improving your relationships with healthier boundaries. We can go and we can talk to other people and we can examine their life and we can say, how has this idea, how has it improved your life? How has it impacted your life? What is the fruit of that idea. We can look at that in business. And when we take a business strategy and and apply it to a business, we can look at other people's businesses and say, how do their ideas, their, their ideology, their way of operating their business, how has it affected their business for the good and for the bad? What's the fruit from these ideas? And we can judge by that, whether they work or not. And those are kind of when we're talking about ideas, When we're moving to something that's more of an ideology or a worldview, I like to look at more macro pictures. And that's what we have been frequently doing here on the show, whether it's talking about socialism in the USSR um, or communism in communist China, the fruits of these ideas, these ideologies on really big macro levels. I like to look throughout history and say, how have these ideas? ideologies, where have them been, have them been implemented and how have they been implemented? How have these ideologies been implemented in the world? And once they were, what were the fruits of that? What happened in society? What happened with people's quality of life? What happened with um, vice and crime, um, ad- addiction within society when a certain set of ideologies were implemented. What happened to uh, birth rates and adoption rates and um, um, orphans and homelessness? Like what's happening in the macro of society? And we kind of covered this um, back in episode 174, where we looked at the difference between uh, American society in 1950 versus 2020. And we looked at how society, the fabric of society really has changed in such a a drastic way in 70 short years. And we looked at some, from my vantage point, some things that probably precipitated um, the shift and change in the cultural fabric of America. And, and, And there you can see we had in 1950, a certain set of ideologies that Um, the majority of America was living by. And then a new set of ideologies entered and the culture began to change. And so that's one way that I like to look at ideologies and worldviews as a whole of saying, when people believe these things, what's the fruit of that in society? When people believe karma, when you believe in karma, not just reaping and sowing, you know, do good, get good, do bad, get bad, but karma, where you're actually having to pay for your past sins. When you believe in karma, what's the fruit of that in society? Well, we can look at India, for instance, we can look at China, for instance, and we can see the fruit of that isn't very good, the fruit of karma. And why is that? Well, because when someone is suffering, they, as you would believe in karma, When someone is suffering, it's because they're suffering from something that happened in their past life. And they're actually paying for something that happened in their past life. So if I, as a person who wants to get better karma to help me um, reincarnate into a higher level in my future life, I would actually not want to help that person because by helping that person, I'm actually hurting them because I'm not allowing karma to take place. I'm not allowing them to pay for the sins of their past. I'm not allowing them to pay that debt. And because of that, they might come back as a a frog or something in the next life because they didn't pay for that karma in this life. And so I like looking at thought systems and on the macro in societies and say, how do these ideas flush out? How do they play out in society? Likewise, on the the positive side, looking at, you know, parenting, for instance, when our kids, we had at one point, we only had two kids, we have four now, four boys. But when we only had two boys, we, we saw this one family and their kids were just like, so obedient, so respectful, always trying to help young kids. And we 
we asked them, we said, I like the fruit of your life. I enjoy being around your kids. A lot of kids uh, don't really enjoy being around. It can be loud. It can be chaotic. It can be stressful. But I want my kids to have opportunities in the world. And because of that, I want adults, people who are older than them, to want to be around them. So I found parents who have great kids. And then I asked those parents, I said, what are you doing in your parenting that's working so well? And then how can I apply that? And the, oftentimes the answers that we would get from these parents weren't really answers that uh, are popular in society. They're ideas that are criticized in society. But I had to say to myself, my wife and I had to say to ourselves, do we want to be popular in society among our friends or do we want our kids to be successful? Do we want our kids to be well-mannered? Do we want our kids to be able to hold a conversation? Do we want to be able to be at dinner with our friends without our kids interrupting every three minutes and breaking down and throwing fits? We had to weigh that. Well, we chose, I want the fruit of good parenting and therefore I'm going to adopt the ideas and the ideologies of these other parents who have had great success with their kids. So that's how I would start by knowing if something works or not. I would look at societies and then, you know, families and people to say, how do these ideas, how have it worked out for other people? And you can get a pretty good gauge of how it will probably work out for yourself. So now how do you exercise these? Well, I think it starts by understanding and then from there you must act. And you know, there's a a very famous uh, Judeo-Christian saying, which is faith without works is dead or belief without action is worthless. So if you believe a certain ideology, but you do not choose to act on it, let's say you believe that you should drink more water and go to bed and wake up, go to bed early and wake up early and turn off your cell phone um, so you're not staring at the blue light past 7 p.m. If you believe that, but you don't actually do that, then your belief is worthless. So that's where I I would start. I would say, okay, you have looked at the evidence. You can say, I want to be like these people. I want to become like them. You, You look at those old people who are in their 80s, find the ones that are cynical and figure out what they did and do the opposite and find the ones that are joy filled and happy and just have great relationships with their families and say, what did you do? I want to do that. And so that's one thing I look at. I don't just look at people two years down the road, which is very helpful, but it's great to look at people who are decades down the road and observe the mistakes that they made and the good choices that they made. And then you put that into action, whether it's forgiveness, you know, one ideology that I live by is forgiveness. It's when people wrong me, it is my ideology that I need to bless them. I need to figure out how to bless them. It's not always easy. I need to forgive them and living a life of forgiveness where no one is living in my head rent free, but anyone who wrongs me. I need to turn around and figure out, okay, how can I release them of this? How can I bless them in this so that I can live a life that's free of bitterness and resentment? And so that's one ideology and figuring out how to walk out and exercise that forgiveness is not always easy, but it's just a day in, day out saying, this is what I believe. How can I put it into practice today? Now, when we get to the the last part of the question, which is how can I do this without getting insulted or criticized? Um, <laughs> I, I think that is the biggest, the biggest problem that probably all of us have, right? It's the fact that it's truth that sets us free, right? Me understanding how to raise my kids in a healthy way has really set them free. When, when we weren't implementing the things that we believed, our kids were miserable, just miserable. They were not happy children. But the moment that I said, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to live out this ideology in practice with my children, for example, all of a sudden it set us free. Our lives are better. Our children are happy that 
people love being around them. They're a blessing when they're in the room. A conversation with them is great. Our, our relationship with them is blossoming because they're incredible people. And a lot of that comes from exercising an ideology. But I had to put that into practice. While I get criticized, I don't really necessarily get insulted, at least not to my face, about the way that my wife and I parent, but my wife definitely has received a lot of criticism and even some insults based on the way that we choose to raise our children. So this is what they don't tell you. They tell you that the truth will set you free, but they don't tell you that the truth will also get you killed. And that's right. The truth will get you killed. If you choose to live in a manner that is countercultural, people will hate you for it. People will criticize you for it. People will insult you for it. And that goes for whether it's you deciding, hey, friend group, I no longer want to stay up late and eat unhealthy or partake in illegal drugs. I'm going to go to bed early. I'm going to drink more water. I want to exercise. I want to have a disciplined and focused life. Even something as simple as that, people will criticize you for it. People will say, oh, you're just better than everyone else now. Or with your family, if you have toxic relationships, not just family, but relationships in general that are codependent relationships, and you one day decide, you know what? I do not want to live this way anymore. I'm going to practice a different idea, different ideology and put boundaries in my life. Most likely you're going to face criticism. You're going to face blowback because people do not like you disrupting the status quo of living your life countercultural, living your life against the grain. So I do not think that by and large in society, you are able to live out what you perceive and believe and, and are convicted um, by, especially when it's countercultural, without being criticized and without being insulted by people. But we need to figure out, okay, if that is the case, when we are criticized, when we are insulted, how do we then respond? And we're going to talk about that towards the end of this episode. But before we do, I want to talk about Sophie Scholl, and who is an amazing young woman in history. She was a member of the Order of the White Rose and is someone who stood up for her ideology. She stood up for truth. She stood up against the the forces of darkness and evil in the world during Nazi Germany, um, a true hero who believed in something so deeply. She was convicted of something so thoroughly that she was willing to sacrifice her entire life for it. So Sophie Skoll, she was a key member of the White Rose, which was a resistance group that was run at the University of Munich. And they distributed leaflets and used graffiti to decry Nazi crimes and the political system while calling for resistance to the Nazi state and the war. Now, on February 22nd in 1943, I'm going to spoil alert and ruin the end of the story for you, but she was beheaded for treason at the age of 21. A 21-year-old girl in Nazi Germany stood up for what she believed, what she was convicted by, and she paid the ultimate price, the ultimate penalty, and she did so with a, a level of resolve in her heart that says, no, I did the right thing. I stood up and I did the right thing in the face of criticism, in the face of death, in, in the face of insults. She was convicted through and through of her ideology, of her belief. Now, uh, this the information from the story I got from the National World War II Museum dot org, um, and the link is in the show notes if you want to learn more about Sophie, um, an incredible young woman. But I'm gonna we're gonna briefly go through her story today on this episode as it is one that is so inspiring for for me, and I th I think will be inspiring for you when we're working to walk out things that we believe, even when it might cost us something great. Now, 
not all of us, probably very, very few of us in our lifetime is going to face something like, like Sophie did. But if we're not able to resolve in our hearts on a level like Sophie has resolved in her heart, we can easily bend to the first wave of criticism for the first insult, for the first blowback from whether it's our clientele, whether it's our family, whether it's our friends, whether it's our relationships on the things that we desire to walk out in our life. Now, Sophie, she was born in May of 1921. She was one of six and she was born to just a normal middle-class family in Germany. Her dad um, at one point was a mayor and then he was an auditor for the state. So just a normal middle-class girl. Um, When the Nazis came into power in 1933, Sophie was only 12 years old. And like most of her siblings, she was excited and just stoked about the National Socialist Party. She became a member of the National Socialist Party um, and was really kind of part of that cult youth. And that the most teenagers in that time really believed the ideals that were being propagated by Nazi Germany in that time. They were really excited about the direction that everything was going. Sophie as a young girl, she was also very, she loved nature. She loved plays. She loved reading. She loved literature. She loved music. So she was just a normal, just a normal girl. But her parents, her parents, especially her father, did not like all of his children's involvement with the Nazi youth groups. And he really didn't try to hide that. He was very critical of the Nazi party from the beginning, and he had raised his family along along strong Christian values. So Robert Scholl viewed what was happening, who's the father, viewed what was happening in Germany and their children's interest with Nazism with growing fear and horror. He saw what was happening. He saw the ideology of the Nazi party that was being put forth. And he was able to recognize and say, this is going to lead down a dark and dangerous path. Now, I say that because of this next point, which he would have on a daily occurrence at the dinner table with his children, they would have open and honest conversations and debate about what was happening in society and in their country. He did not try to hide it. The family did not try to hide it. They did not sweep things underneath the rug. But they said, we're going to openly talk about the values that we believe as a family, the values that we see happening within society and within this the national socialist movement. We're going to talk about it openly. What is socialism? What is the, the fruit of these ideologies? And they were able to criticize it. And that's one thing that I love about this podcast. I love about the conversations that I'm able to have with each and every one of you, um, whether it's through this or through social media or through texting on WhatsApp about a lot of the things that are happening in the world is that we're able to have an open and honest conversation about what's happening in the world. And I think that is extremely valuable for us to be able to have open conversations with one another about subjects that are oftentimes considered taboo, that are considered off the table. But it's through talking about these things and we can come to a clearer viewpoint, a clearer way of viewing the world and can actually save us from falling into very toxic, deadly ideologies and enable us to stand up and stand for something that we believe in. So Sophie's brothers, especially her older brother, um, Hans was his name. He actually founded what was called the White Rose. And there are other members of the non-Nazi groups of young people that also joined in with the White Rose. Now, these associations 
um, they all, the group that he started and the other Nazi associations at that point, they all shared and propagated a love for nature, for outdoor adventure, for music, for the arts and German literature um, and romanticism. And at the beginning, uh, the, the Nazi ideology really painted it as it being something that was compatible with Nazism. But then these alternative non-Nazi groups were slowly being dissolved um, disbanded and finally banned in 1936. It was actually illegal to be part of a non-Nazi party um, uh, youth club. But Hans, the oldest Sophie's oldest brother, um, he remained active in one of these groups to the point where in 1937, he, along with several other of, of Sophie's schoolmates and siblings, were arrested by the Nazi party. And this really marked Sophie. She's like, if, if the Democratic Socialist Party is so great, why are they arresting my brother? Why are they arresting my friends based on our, our love for nature, based on our religious beliefs, based on our, our love for, for German romanticism literature? Why are we being arrested for something just because we're not a part of the Nazi clubs. And it was a matter of weeks later in September of 1939 that Hitler finally invaded Poland. And then two days later, France and Britain had declared war on Germany. So at this point, her older brothers were sent off to fight on the front and Sophie, she wanted to become a school teacher. So she graduated high school in the spring of 1940 and started her apprenticeship at uh, becoming a kindergarten teacher. But, and she eventually wanted to study biology and philosophy. But in order for her to study biology and philosophy at university, she had to first spend a period of time working for the state, working for the National Labor Service, which was attached to the military apparatus. So Sophie hoped that as becoming a teacher, that she'd be able to skip her service, but she wasn't. And as she joined in, she hated every moment of it. And she grew more and more um, distrusting and doubting of the Nazi regime. And she, as it turned out, she was right. So finally, in 1942, after serving her, her time in the National Labor Party, she moves to Munich to study biology and philosophy. And at this point, her brother Hans is back from the front lines where they've they've seen these horrible atrocities. They've heard of these incredible war crimes against the Polish people um, and just the brutality of the Nazi party. And so at this time, Hans has come back. He started the White Rose and now he's a medical student at the same university as Sophie. And him and his friends, they begin to openly question and openly talk about the, the corruption and the wickedness, vileness of the Nazi party. It was at that point in June of 1942 that the White Rose, without Sophie, Sophie was not a part of it at this point, but it was at that time that they began printing and distributing leaflets around Munich and they began calling their fellow students and the German public to action. Other members of their circle, their friend circle, joined and they began they wrote four pamphlets in that first year. And Sophie, as a student, she had seen the, pl the pamphlets around. She had applauded their content. She was really encouraged by these people speaking out with truth and speaking to the, the powers that be without fear. And she came to find out that it was actually her brother who was the founder of the White Rose. And when she found this out, she demanded that she was be able to join the group. Her brother resisted and resisted for a time, but finally he let her in, even though they both knew the risks that they were taking. So together, they published and distributed a total of six pamphlets. They were first were typed on a typewriter, then multiplied by mimeograph. So they, they, they found some bootleg printing material. And at that time, there was rations on paper 
envelopes and stamps. And they, they began soliciting through underground networks, people to give them paper, people to send them stamps in order for them to mail this uh, resistance material out across Germany. And so they, they started off actually just by going through the address book in the phone book, just going through addresses and handwriting each envelope and distributing thousands of these letters, um, reaching households all across Germany. And they did it in a way so that the, the Gestapo would believe that they were actually multiple White Rose organizations because they'd send it from different post offices all across Germany. So they made it seem as if this organization was much bigger than it really was when it really was just a couple of young college students who were creating this media, creating th these letters to really expose the war crimes of the Nazi party. But in 1943, January 1943, things began to change and the white rose began to believe that they were really at a turning point in their nation's history and they began to become more bold. Uh, in one of their letters, they actually wrote this and I quote, even the most dull witted German has had his eyes opened by the terrible bloodbath, which in the name of freedom and honor of the German nation, they have unleashed upon Europe and unleashed anew each day. The German name will forever remain tarnished unless finally the German youth stand up, pursue revenge and atonement, smite our tormentors and finds a new intellectual Europe. Students, the German people look to us. The responsibility is ours. Just as the power of the spirit broke the Napoleonic terror in 1813, so too will it break the terror of the National Socialists in 1943. As the group grew bolder, they decided to distribute their sixth pamphlet, which ended up being their final pamphlet, by dropping these pamphlets around their university in Munich on February 18th. So they were handing them out across university. And at one point, the scholars assume that Sophie pushed an entire stack of these pamphlets off a railing into the open auditorium where uh, into the central hall, which is now what has become an, an iconic scene in all the movies that you see about Sophie Skoll. Um, but while she did this, the janitor, who was a strong Nazi supporter, witnessed her push all the papers off, and her and her brothers Hans were arrested immediately by the Gestapo. And in fact, Hans had the draft of the seventh pamphlet in his bag. He, he tried to eat it when he was arrested, but they pulled it out of his mouth. They caught him, and uh, him, Hans... Sophie and their, their other friend, Christoph, were all arrested the same day. Now, the three of them endured a, a mock trial, you know, a fake trial with, with arginous uh, interrogations, they interrogated for hours. They had this fake mock trial. And at, at the end of it, they tried to take all the blame, saying it was just us three who did it to save um, their, their three other friends who were also in the White Rose, but that failed. On, and finally, on February 22nd, just four days after uh, they were arrested, both Sophie, Hans, and Christoph were executed by the guillotine on February 22nd, 1943. Now, again, this is a, an extreme example, but what I really love about Sophie's story is that she was just a normal girl. She was 21 at the age of her execution, 21. And she believed that by standing up and speaking truth, not only she did believe by, but she believed she had a responsibility to speak to the truth. She believed she had a responsibility to do something. She believed that she had a conviction deep in her heart that this is something that was worth giving my life for, both in life and in death. And thinking about your, your question, Michael, thinking about 
how does one exercise an ideology? Sometimes we can do it step by step. We can ex exercise one idea and the next idea, but there comes a point when we're exercising a full blown ideology, we have to kind of take that step and say, you know, this is what I believe. This is what I believe to be true. And I am going to stand up and do something about it. And there, there comes a point where if, if we're not willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of our beliefs, are our beliefs real or are they still built on some, some weak ground? And we have to dive in deeper to understand is, is what I'm doing, is it worth it? Was it worth it for Sophie and her brother to stand up against the atrocities and call the German people to resist and sabotage the Nazi party at every chance they got? Was it worth to give her life at the age of 21? And we need to do that too, not, not just in the big things. I don't think probably many of us are going to give our lives for uh, the ideology that we might be trying to adopt. But what we probably will face is pushback from our friends, our family, our relatives, um, our coworkers, um, people around us that don't see life the same way, or they don't like that we're disrupting the homeostasis that are currently existing within your relationship group. So, simple folks like you and me, right? Uh, how can we walk out some of our ideas and ideology, whether it's setting up healthier boundaries in our life with relationships, especially if we have these codependent, manipulative relationships that are, are toxic, that cause anxiety, and fear, hatred within us, or whether it's working on our physical health, whether it's working on the, the health of our businesses, or how do we walk that out. As we said earlier, no matter what you do, you will probably, if you're walking the road less traveled, you're probably going to face opposition. You're probably going to face criticism and not all criticism is bad. So the first question that I would ask myself when I'm faced with criticism, when I'm faced with insults, as I ask, like, is there validity in what they're saying? When someone criticizes me, instead of just blowing it off or ignoring it or saying, well, the hater's going to hate, I, I take a step back and I say, okay, is there validity in their claims? Oftentimes, the, the people who are talking to us, maybe they just hate us. Maybe they're just trying to stir up strife and conflict. Maybe they don't like the decisions that we're making and their claims are just illegitimate. They're just trying to distract us from the goals that we're trying to reach. They're just uh, upset that we're doing something different, that we're choosing a different path than them at this point in life. So oftentimes the, the criticisms are totally invalid, but there are many times, you know, if it's a parent that's coming to you or a dear friend or someone that you trust is coming to you with these claims, sometimes there's actual real validity to their criticism, especially if their criticism is like, hey, your new mantra of life is really unhealthy. You're going down, you're going down a dark road. Hey, your new philosophy of life, it's actually making you kind of a jerk. You're coming, coming across really arrogant. You're coming across really brash and, and abrupt with people. You know, I, I don't know what's going on, but it, it doesn't seem like it's a, a, a positive step forward. Now there's other ideologies, which might be like I said earlier about forgiveness, if you're beginning to adopt a, a, a way of life that says, you know, I'm going to forgive people. I'm going to bless those that hate me. People are not going to like that. People are going to say, hey, the way that you're, you know, you need to stand up for yourself. You need to have a backbone, you know, forgive, but never forget, like cut those toxic people out of your life. And maybe you're saying, actually, I, I want to live a different way. I want to be a person that." that blesses those who hate me. And that's, you know, again, I'm trying to be more uh, forthright in this podcast, 
And again, that those that's a, a common ideology, a common practice that, that springs from a Christian Judeo worldview, one that I have adopted, one that I try to live by. I don't always live by it well, but that's one that I, I, I try to live by. So th- those are the first questions. When, when I'm getting faced with criticism, I take it and I say, okay, which box does it fit in? Is there some truth in it that I need to take that information, input into the system and evaluate okay, how do I, I, am I seeing things rightly? Am I acting rightly? Am I am actually growing into a better person or is this just making me a jerk? And then the other side is saying, well, no, no, it's not. They're just stirring up strife. Then you can deal with that appropriately. So there's this great proverb I love, which it goes like this. This is answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you become like him. Then the next part goes, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he thinks he's wise in his own eyes. And so this is the tension. It's do we answer people who are criticizing us according to the way that they're criticizing us to, you know, make sure that they know that we're not idiots and they're not wise? Or do we refrain from answering and we are just ignorant of it? We ignore it. We just let it roll off our back because we don't want to engage in that level of argumentative, uh, toxic culture. So the, there's, the, I don't think there's ever like a, a straight answer. It's not one or the other. It's wisdom. And we talk about this a lot here. It's wisdom of knowing in this moment, how do I respond in this moment? How do I react to the person that's sitting in front of me in the right way? So if people are attacking you and insulting because of your new lifestyle, again, maybe it's justified, maybe it's not. But we can know one thing at, at the base of everything. My suggestion for, for the best life for you and for anyone is to always return evil with good. Whenever you are cursed, you bless. Whenever people steal from you, you give to them. Whenever people try to slander you, talk well about them and it will go well with you. When when people abuse you, be patient with them. When they they slander you, respond with kind words. Appeal gently when evil things are said about you. Rather than responding in the same spirit, respond in the opposite spirit. Respond in the opposite kind. And that will really take the fangs out. That will really defang people who are against you. And it might not happen overnight. There have been times where it's taken my wife and I years to to play our boundaries out until finally the conflict runs out of gas, but we just keep that same, okay, how can I maintain my individuality and how my boundaries and how can I bless people even in the face of criticism? How can I not engage and not always perfect in it? Not always perfect in it, but how can we aim to live our lives counterculture, live our, our lives in the opposite spirit? Welcome to the Weaver and Loom segment of our show. This is where we take uh, ancient quotes, um, ideas, wisdom nuggets and bits and apply them to our life to connect us to our purpose, connect us to our meaning, to connect us to our destiny. And so closing up this episode, um, we've we've talked about a lot, but as I was... uh, as I was preparing for this episode, I came across this incredible man. I've been, as I mentioned, I have been exploring my Polish heritage. I'm half Polish. And um, the more that I explore and read about Polish history, the more that I realize that um, the the Polish people have been enslaved. They've been uh, abused. They've been at the hand of genocide uh, in World War One and World War Two, and even before that. And in the midst of that, there's been some amazing men and women who have stood up as, as Polacks 
um, in the face of great tyranny, in the face of great darkness and uh, really trying times. And so as I was researching actually for this episode, I came across this uh, amazing man. His name is Maximilian Kolbe, who's actually um, uh, was put in as a saint by uh Pope John Paul II in 1982. But Maximilian, he died in Auschwitz, the German Nazi concentration camp. His inmate number was 16670. And he was murdered after he had volunteered on July 29th, 1941 to replace his life with another inmate that had been selected for death. So there was three men that had escaped Auschwitz and the guard said, well, as punishment on the camp for these men escaping, we're going to put 10 men into a starvation cell where they're in there until they die. And essentially uh, sentencing 10 men to death. And this one man by the name of Franciszek Gawinitzek, who had a wife and child and was selected for death. And when they called out his name, he yelled, I have a wife and I have children. And so Maximilian stood up and said, I will volunteer in his place. And they said, great. And so they took him and it was the, the sole act of sacrifice of that kind that was recorded in Auschwitz. And as it happened, Colby died on August 14th, 1941. The all the other men in the starvation cell, I believe seven or eight out of the ten, had died from starvation, and there's two or three of them left. And so they wanted to use the cell for other purposes. And so he died by lethal injection, and the next day his body was burned. Uh, just an amazing act of of sacrifice, which earned him to be deemed a saint by uh, Pope John. Paul II. But he said this, and I I found it so fitting for what we were talking about here today. Here's a quote. It says, no one in the world can change truth. What we can do and should do is seek truth and to serve it when we have found it. The real conflict is the inner conflict Beyond armies and occupation and the hecatombs of the extermination camps, there are two irreconcilable enemies in the depths of every soul, good and evil, sin and love. And what use are the victories on the battlefield if we ourselves are defeated in our innermost selves? What use are the victories on the battlefield if we are defeated in our innermost selves? And I think that's one takeaway that I've had from this episode is thinking, I, we, could, we could all build amazing businesses. We could do amazing feats, build towers to our name, uh, feed millions and millions of starving people. We could cure cancer. But what happens if we lose the battle within ourselves? What happens if it comes to the end of Maximilian's life and he decides not to be selfless, but to be selfish? Two last interesting facts about Maximilian is one, he actually survived Nagasaki. Like he survived the Nagasaki bomb before he volunteered his life in Auschwitz. And the man that he saved ended up surviving Auschwitz and living until he was 94. Just an incredible, incredible man by by all accounts. He even started um, a radio station before he was put into the internment camps. Um, And so when I was reading about his life, I thought, wow, this is an incredible man who not just had ideologies, not just had values, but were willing to, to sacrifice his very life in a very selfless, selfless way and to walk out the things that he believed to the fullest. And that is something I think that um, we should and do all aspire to. As we walk away from this episode, what are the battlefields within yourself that you are battling? There are, of course, 
all the things that we want to do with our lives, all the impact that we want to make, but what is the interior state of our lives, of your heart, of your mind, of your relationships? Those are the things that we must preserve. Those are the things we must fight for, that we might walk our lives and end our lives knowing that we had victory within our innermost selves, that we never bow down to the darkness and the evil that we so wish to rid the world of. And that is, the, I think, the response that I have to this question is that, yes, we can. there's all these ideologies that we, that we want to live out, but when we're faced with criticism and insults, are we going to lose ourselves? Are we going to lose our dignity? Are we going to lose our values? Are we going to lose the very ideologies that we are fighting for by fighting for those ideologies? Or are the things that we believe in the way that we choose to walk out and carry our lives are they actually leading us to a better place that enables us to win in the battlefields of our heart? That is all for this episode. If you want to get some more information about Sophie Skoll and the Order of the White Rose, you can find them in the show notes along with more information on Maximilian Colby and his life, incredible life. Uh, if you have a question, I would love to hear it. You can message me on Instagram or WhatsApp me at plus one two zero two nine two two zero two two zero, and you can be like Michael and get some awesome stickers sent your way. Finally, remember what Colby said: what we can do and should do is to seek truth and serve it when we have found it, so that we can go out and own the future. <laughs>